Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I am Steve Baker. I'm the director of broadcasting for Miami University Athletics, and many of you know me as the longtime voice of Miami University football and basketball on the radio. It is my distinct honor and privilege to be the master of ceremonies, if you will, for this afternoon's celebration, and it is a celebration. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Just like you, I have known the Shriver family for many, many years. Uh, ever since my association with Miami University began, I've worked with Darcy in countless Tomahawk Club meetings, Red and White Club meetings, and so much more with Scott throughout the years, and of course with Phil and Martha. It is, again, my honor and privilege to speak on behalf of the family, so to speak, here this afternoon. For many of you, we wanted to begin this program on time, so you did not get the opportunity to sign a guest book on your way in. There are four guest books out on the concourse. We ask that you please take the time to sign one of those and pass along your best wishes to the family in one of those guest books after this afternoon's ceremony. The family of Philip Raymond Shriver welcomes you and is pleased that you could be a part of the celebration of the life of their husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, brother, and uncle. Martha Shriver and the family seated here before me are pleased that you could come and join in the remembrance and reflection of what Phil called a good life. Yes, today is a celebration instead of a morning and a time to reflect upon the good life of the man whose passing uh, uh, does indeed bring us sadness, but also fills us with such warm, happy memories that the sadness is overcome with love. The family hopes that today's celebration rekindles many such happy memories in each one of you. The pianist for today's program needs absolutely no introduction to you. Uh, most of you know Rod Nemps as a long time and connection to the Miami University community. Incidentally, Rod was an advisee of Phil Shriver's in the Department of History and a student with whom he was particularly proud and for good reason. The music played and sung today represents Phil Shriver's favorites and his requests. Many in attendance here today are here because of Dr. Philip Shriver's leadership of Miami University as her 17th president. And I think it is so fitting that we begin our celebration with words of Miami University's 21st president, Dr. David C. Hodge. Good afternoon. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to stand here with you today, celebrating the life of a truly remarkable man whose career in the Navy, Kent State, Miami, and in the broader higher education and civic communities was truly exemplary. On behalf of the my entire Miami family, I extend our sympathies to Martha and to the children for the loss of your husband and father. We share with you the sadness that comes with the loss of one so beloved. We also share with you the pride, the pride in a life well lived, a life that left the world a better place. During his 16 years at the university, many great things happened. It was a time of enormous transformation. Miami opened new campuses in Middletown and Hamilton, first in the state. We opened a campus in Luxembourg, of all places, celebrating the importance of being connected to the world, a theme that has run through our history and is more powerful today than ever. Miami's first 10 doctoral programs were launched and 30 buildings were constructed on three campuses. I don't know if you noticed, but many of the pictures showed Phil with a shovel in his hand. The Western College for Women was brought into Miami and the total enrollment nearly doubled. Miami gained recognition as one of the nation's 20 most selective public universities, as well as one of the best values in higher education. In 1972, President Shriver met with Chief Forrest Olds of the Miami tribe, beginning a relationship that would become so important to us. That relationship was nurtured and blossomed in the partnership with Chief Floyd Leonard. This is a relationship that is not only a partnership, but has become part of our mutual identities. 
it's another one of the important legacies that Phil Shriver has left. Of course, there were times when Miami and President Shriver were challenged severely. Perhaps none more dramatic and traumatic than dealing with the Vietnam protests. President Shriver had to draw from his experience, his wisdom, and his deep connection and understanding of the student body to find solutions in the heat of the moment to a difficult crisis. It is a time like this when the true character of an individual is revealed, and Dr. Shriver displayed a calm and caring, yet firm spirit that carried us through the turbulent times. Okay, so there was this little incident with the flush in that some of you remember more fondly than perhaps President Shriver did. But it was a remarkable time, and his character was certainly revealed. My first introduction to President Shriver was reading his book on the history of Miami as we were preparing to move to Oxford. Now, I had read other accounts of Miami, but it was when I read about Miami through his eyes that I really understood what this place is all about. His love for the university, his finely tuned sense of history, and most of all, his engaging spirit provided a sense of the soul of this wonderful place. I feel incredibly fortunate to have had the opportunity to share some years at Miami with President Shriver. He faithfully, enthusiastically attended every possible major function, linking the past and the present. He and Martha were at every, every possible football game, as well as hockey. Valerie and I were always thrilled and honored to be able to co-host the President's Box with Martha and Phil. President Shriver taught at least one class every year, except one during his 52 years in the classroom. He noted, it has been said that more than records, buildings, and budgets, the real continuity of a university is the generations of young people who come to us and older generations who meet with them, deal with them, and try to help them into adulthood. This is the essence of teaching. And Philip Shriver was the quintessential teacher. He was certainly one of the most beloved of all Miami presidents. His accomplishments stand on their own lofty merit. But more than anything, he will be remembered as the embodiment of the Miami spirit, a person whose energy and caring, whose personal connection to students, faculty, and alumni clearly defines what it means to be a Miamian. Thank you, Dr. Hodge. Martha and the family would also like to thank Dr. Hodge and all of the Miami faculty and staff who have so wonderfully expressed their love and support, and the many in the Miami family who have helped make this celebration possible. A special thanks goes to Kathy Squantz for her tireless efforts in assisting in the planning of this event, and to those who have transformed this arena into a lovely auditorium. Brad Clark, Tom Fletterman, and the absolutely amazing special facilities staff Bob Schmidt, our university archivist, Jack Keegan and the botany department for the lovely floral display, and Barbara Banks at the Print Center. Thank you to all of you. Dr. Schreiber was an historian with an abiding interest in the ethno history of the American Indian. He often said it was his honor to teach at a college, at a college called Miami, and he shared a close friendship with several leaders of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma as together they forged a new spirit of mutual cooperation and respect. Here to present a message from the Miami tribe of Oklahoma is the son of former Chief of the Miami's Floyd Leonard and current Miami Professor of Business Management, Dr. Joseph Leonard. Miami Chief Tom Gamble unfortunately could not be here today. He is here in spirit though and he asked me to read his message to the Shriver family and to the Miami University family. When I became second chief, I was told by Chief Floyd Leonard what a friend Dr. Philip Shriver was of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma. They both served in the armed services during World War II in the South Pacific. 
They both spent their careers as educators, and they loved music. Chief Leonard impressed upon me, above all, that Dr. Shriver was a whole human being, one with uh, qualities of graciousness, wisdom, and courage that allowed him to reach out to our tribal people, people who were evicted from their homelands in the Midwest in the 1840s. Following very successful contacts with Chief Forrest Oles, Dr. Shriver developed a long-time friendship with Chief Leonard. They fostered exchanges which have led to strong ties between our tribe and the university. We were so privileged that these two great educators came together. As chief, I was fortunate to meet Dr. Shriver at the University Art Museum a few years ago during the dedication of the outdoor sculpture, uh, com com excuse me, commemorating our tribe, the university, and the city of Oxford. I was deeply touched by his warmth and his concern for us. Dr. Shriver has become part of our history. Chief Thomas E. Gamble, Miami Tribe of Oklahoma. Thank you very much, Dr. Leonard. I've received the following proclamation from the mayor of the city of Oxford and have been asked to share that with you at this time. Whereas Dr. Philip R. Shriver truly embodied the essence of a person who cared very deeply for Miami University and the community through his unselfish and continuous efforts to improve them. And whereas in 1947, Dr. Shriver started his teaching career at Kent State University, becoming Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Kent in 1963. And whereas Dr. Shriver served as president of Miami University from 1965 through 1981, and taught at least one class each academic year, the last coming in 1998. And whereas, during Dr. Schreiber's tenure, Miami opened its European campus in Luxembourg, and regionally in Hamilton and Middletown. More than 40 buildings were constructed, and Western College for Women was acquired by Miami. Enrollment on the Oxford campus increased from 9,000 to 15,000 and Miami gained recognition as one of the nation's 20 most selective public universities, as well as one of the best values in higher education. And whereas Dr. Schreiber valued his relationship with the Miami tribe of Oklahoma that spanned nearly 40 years. A relationship was fostered with Chief Forrest Olds in 1972, strengthened into a deep friendship with Chief Floyd Leonard, and reaffirmed through meeting Chief Thomas Gamble in 2008 during the opening ceremony of the How the Miami People Live exhibition. And whereas, Dr. Shriver served this community as co-chair of the Oxford United Way Fund Drive, as instructor for Leadership Oxford Area Academy, and president of the Oxford Rotary Club. Dr. Schreiber enriched the Oxford area as a member of the Oxford Museum Association, the Oxford Presbyterian Church, the Oxford NAACP, the Three Valley Conservation Trust, the W.E. Smith Family Charitable Trust Board of Directors, OxAct, and the Oxford Community Foundation Board of Directors, and in various other capacities too numerous to list. And whereas Dr. Schreiber had, for many years, given of his personal time and energy to serve the Oxford community and should be remembered for his many contributions, tireless dedication, and valuable service. And now, therefore, in recognition of Dr. Schreiber's contributions to our community and its citizens, we hereby express our deep appreciation for his outstanding service to our community and extend to his family our sincere sympathy upon his passing. In witness thereof, I have unto set my hand and caused the seal of the City of Oxford to be affixed this 28th day of May 2011, Kenneth H. Bogard, Vice Mayor. Dr. Schreiber was a quietly religious man, a man of strong personal faith who loved his church family at the Oxford Presbyterian Church, as he did at United Church of Christ in Kent prior to coming here to Oxford in 1965. 
Interestingly, Phil felt a strong connection to Miami's very first president, Robert Hamilton Bishop, a Presbyterian minister and also a professor of history, born in Scotland and buried just a little way away from here in Miami's formal gardens. Philip proudly kept his mother's family's Buchanan tartan as a banner hanging in his office and spoke often of how his Scottish blood was stirred at the sound of bagpipes. We are pleased to have the pastors from the Oxford Presbyterian Church, Drs. Mark and Barbara Barnes, officiating in our service today. And in addition, we are pleased to have with us Mr. Alexander Watt of the Clan Buchanan in Ayr, Scotland, who will again, I have no doubt, stir the Scottish blood. Let's pray. Eternal God, in you we live and move and have our being. We thank you for all the gifts of life, and especially today, for the gift of the life of Dr. Philip Schreiber, who was so important to us, to this university, and to this community. As we remember and celebrate his life, we remember that Dr. Schreiber's faith in you was the source of his life and the center of his vocation. 
and we praise you that just as you accompanied him throughout his earthly journey, you have now raised him with Christ and welcomed him to his eternal home, where in company with all the saints, he has come into the fullness of joy you have promised. We thank you, God. Be present with us here as we remember and celebrate Dr. Shriver's life that those who grieve may be comforted and that we may be refreshed in hope and strengthened for the work of love in the days remaining to us. You are our strength, O God, our rock and redeemer, and in Christ Jesus, our faithful savior in life and death. So to you we give all glory, praise, and honor, now and forever. Amen. On the back of your program, you'll find the lyrics to all of our hymns this afternoon. We encourage you to stay seated, but sing along with us on all of these hymns this afternoon. We'll begin with Amazing Grace, and we'll be singing all five verses. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that brought my heart to hear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious. Barbara and I will read from three of Phil Shriver's favorite scriptures, 
Reading first from the Hebrew Scriptures, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And these words from Romans chapter 8. Who will separate us from the love of God? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, not powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For this perishable nature must put on the imperishable, and this mortal nature must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up by victory. O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Let us pray in thanksgiving to God for Phil Shriver. Eternal God, we praise you that your love is everlasting. You can turn the shadow of death into the brightness of the morning light. And so we praise you for all those who have finished their race and now rest from their labor. Especially we thank you for your servant, Philip R. Shriver, for the gift of his life, a life so well lived, for all in him that was good and kind and faithful for everything that made him so dear to us and so precious to you. And so we lift up our thanks. We thank you for his great love for Martha, his dearly beloved wife of 67 years, for his children Carolyn, Susan, Mindy, Darcy, and Scott, and their spouses, and his grandchildren and great-grandchildren and extended family, all of whom he loved so dearly. We thank you for his extraordinary gifts as a teacher and scholar and historian and writer and storyteller and administrator and public leader. We thank you for his devoted love for and commitment to Miami University 
and his strong and visionary and wise leadership, especially through a critical period of challenges and growth. We thank you for his embrace of the whole Oxford community, for the gift of his friendship, for his respect for all persons. We thank you for his service to his country, for his devotion to you and his faithfulness to the mission of your church. And even more than his extraordinary gifts, O oh God, we thank you for the qualities that made him so remarkable, his integrity and honor, his humble spirit and his wisdom, his character and his vision, his kindness and his goodwill, and all the other remarkable qualities that so enriched our lives and the life of this community. We praise you for the impact of his life and the legacy he left in so many, many generations. Dear God, we thank you that goodness and mercy followed him all the days of his life and that he dwells in the house of the Lord forever. And as we continue to give thanks for his life, even as we mourn our loss, we ask that you ease our sorrow and help us to trust your love, which never fails. We pray especially for his family and dearest friends and ask that you lift them into the peace of your presence. Amen. The old rugged cross, both verses, and again, you may stay seated. We are privileged to have with us today another good friend of Dr. Shriver and the family, the Honorable Timothy Derrickson, representative to the 53rd Ohio House District. He'll offer reflections on the citizen.
The Ohio House of Representatives Journal, dated May 4, 2011. Ohio not only lost a true ambassador to our state, but also a friend to all who knew him. Dr. Shriver graduated from Yale, Harvard, and Columbia University before serving as a commissioned officer in the Navy during World War II. He served on the USS Murray in the Marshall Islands, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. Dr. Shriver was very proud of his service to our country as a naval officer and was recognized by the state of Ohio in 2009 as an inductee to the Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame. Following a service in the Navy, he accepted a teaching position at Kent State University, later being named Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Shriver came to Miami in 1965, holding the position of president until 1981. During his professional career, he was also selected to serve on the Bicentennial Commission, the Federal Reserve Board, and the Ohio Historical Society. It was during Dr. Shriver's time in Oxford and at Miami that my family got to know the Shrivers. I was a youth member at the Oxford Presbyterian Church where our families attended. My mom and dad shared much respect for the Shrivers and their love for the community. My dad appreciated how much Dr. Shriver always had a kind word for him. And mom recalls a story where she was given a strong admonition over the church pew one Sunday to think long and hard about accepting an invitation from a club Martha was in. He and Bob Boken teamed up and strongly influenced my mom's decision to join the ranks with Martha and her peers in PEO. Growing up here in Oxford and to this day, I was always humbled that Dr. Schreiber knew me by name and always made an effort to speak to me when we were together at Rotary and other civic events. As a longtime member of the Oxford Rotary Club, he embodied the, obje the objective of Rotary, which is to encourage and foster the ideal of service as a basis of worthy enterprise through personal, business, and community life. While Dr. Shriver accomplished much in the area of academics, many of us knew Dr. Shriver in a much more personal way. His greatest accomplishments are evidence today in the love of his family and the integrity and character he demonstrated throughout his life. Dr. Schreiber always took time to communicate with others, conveying a sincere interest in all of us. For a man of his academic achievement, he never held the lofty belief that he was above anyone. He respected all who crossed his path, those with advanced degrees or limited education, as well as PhDs and lifetime students. Dr. Schreiber always extended a firm handshake and addressed me by name whenever we met. As I've reminisced with others, this was a pattern wherever he went, in town, away at conferences, at award ceremonies, in his beloved lakeside community, with his large extended family, in his last days at Woodland. His personal interest in everyone he met and his words of encouragement were always freely offered. He was a man of deep faith, which extended beyond the confines of his own Presbyterian denomination. I have heard from founding members of my church, Oxford Bible Fellowship, that he was pivotal, pivotal in the development and nurture of our church's founding. He was a staunch believer and defender of things that would promote the concept of love, family, morality, and ethics. This past Sunday at church, it was providential that the message was taught from the book of Titus. In a letter written by the Apostle Paul, he directed Titus to search out and recruit leaders and elders of the church, describing the characteristics that would be most desirable in a leader. As our pastor began his sermon, I was immediately struck by how aptly it described our friend, Dr. Shriver. The passage reads as follows. Urge older men to be temperate, dignified, sensible, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, and perseverance. We will all miss Dr. Shriver. Our lives are richer having known him as a friend, a husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, colleague, defender of freedom, and preserver of history. Now that Phil Shriver is in a better place, our prayers are with you, Martha, and all your family. We are grateful to call you our friends.
eternal Father strong to save. Both verses. Our next speaker was another good friend of Phil's and a teaching colleague, coincidentally a scholar of the history of the Second World War and professor of history emeritus, Dr. Jay Baird, who will offer reflections on the educator. It just warms the heart to be part of this ceremony today. So many of you knew Phil Shriver much more closely than I did, but I was his colleague and had greatest respect from him from the day I set foot on this campus in 1967. And when you hear that old Navy hymn and we come on Memorial Day, we want to remember those like Phil who put his life on the line and many of those who went into the waves and deep, and we want to always be thinking of them. It's an honor to reflect on Phil Schreiber's life because in truth, he was larger than life. He is almost a mythical figure here at, at Miami and rightfully so I think because seldom in the course of our 200 years history has an individual joined the roles of scholar and teacher and blended them so beautifully as he did in his life. I remember in one of his speeches uh, during his annual address at the start of the school year, he told the faculty, and I quote, you are paid to dream. Remarkable. He himself set the example for this noble dream. Although Phil Shriver was a realist, he was also a romantic at heart. In one sense, he lived in an earlier America. When the native peoples and early settlers roamed the woods, meadows, and streams that greeted you to, uh, today on your way to this remembrance, he was as much an anthropologist, little known, as he was an historian. And he was attracted to historical excavations and the world of Indian artifacts. As we've heard today and we know, Phil Shriver was a naturally happy and optimistic man and how he loved that last office he had for some 20 years in the history department in Upham Hall overlooking Bishop Woods. And he was delighted to live here in rural Oxford far from the noise of the hectic city. Despite his degrees from Harvard, Yale, and Columbia, Phil Shriver, and we all know it, was a modest man of the heartland. He never lorded it over his colleagues who might have envied his education at three of America's greatest universities. Instead, he remained what he always, always was, a man who loved the past, and brought the joy of living into every classroom he entered. When life's disappointments and the irritations of often petty university politics wore him down, 
Phil Shriver always remembered why we were here, for the students, for their education, and for the joy we scholars take in our research and writing. It's a great privilege. As we all know, Dr. Shriver carried himself with a dignity and quiet confidence that was admired by his students and colleagues alike. And if we heard today, it's due in no, no small part uh, because he served on the SS Murray in the South Pacific Theater, stared death in the face at Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and his ship was even present in Yokohama Harbor when the signing of General MacArthur and the Japanese Emperor when they came together in August 1945 for the surrender. But for him, the horrors of war also had certain lessons to teach and he viewed the opportunity to educate the young men and women who would be future officers in our ROTC programs as a sacred trust. We would have never thought of closing down ROTC like the elite blue bloods of the East. Dr. Shriver was fated to lead the university during the crisis period of the student revolution during the war uh, in Vietnam, and I think many of us have forgotten, some may not have known, but some know with great pain, that six to eight Molotov cocktails were, were thrown into various buildings here, and there were multitude fires that were put out, and we had members of the faculty and the community standing guard through the night, never knowing what was coming, and we had definitely outside agitators coming in here from, from the Socialist International, and there's absolutely no question in my mind that that was going on. And how bravely he kept the peace here. Walking the campus among the unruly crowds, sometimes deep into the night, reasoning with the unruly and dis disillusioned students at the sundial and uptown as well. The beauty of it was he understood the students and they understood him as well. And the bravery he demonstrated and the composure he kept under fire kept the peace here at that most difficult time and will be long remembered. Because of his broad life experiences, Dr. Shriver had an intellectual maturity which transcended historical fashion. Over the course of his over five decades in the classroom, Historical fads spread widely. These included New Left history, psychohistory, Marxist and neo-Marxist history, structuralism, post-structuralism, modernism, post-modernism, post-colonialism, and so on. And there were countless other of these theoretical constructs, all of whose adherents were certain that only they had the proper insight and the tools to truly interpret history. Their language often consisted of tortured prose understood only by a tiny minority, even of scholars, who could be initiated into the mysteries of their particular school of thought. The beauty of it, when you came into a Phil Schreiber classroom and I had the joy of hearing Miami history, his very last class, when they entered his classroom, they escaped all this and saw history and heard about it as it actually had been lived, as a narrative, a story told and framed within a moral tale. There they learned that the impo most important intellectual lessons need not be phrased in opaque, uh, opaque jargon. In a Shriver classroom, depth and meaning lay in simplicity, bonded by character and endurance. His unforgettable lectures were delivered in an almost lyric style, and you have to say they were bathed in elegance. One could see his eyes shining as he was totally immersed in the subject and in the joy of teaching. And when the last student who studied under Phil Shriver dies, it'll be around 2080 or 2090, maybe a little more, when we're all gone 
And when the last remembrances have been told to the children and the grandchildren and even great-grandchildren, when all this has faded away, and you can see it on his face here, his moral simplicity will live on and his memory will endure. And what will it be that is remembered with such fondness as the years roll by? We will remember that for Phil Shriver, history took on a moral dimension. He spoke not only to our minds and intellects, but to our senses and our hearts as well. One former student, knowing that I was going to give this talk, called this week and said, she felt so warm and safe listening to Phil Shriver. It was as if she were at a crackling campfire deep in the night, hearing a great tribal leader lend meaning to the challenging questions of the universe. Through Dr. Shriver, she said, she learned that history tells us why we are here and helps us search for the truth. The words cascaded from his voice like a river of song. He spoke to us where we live, and we were captivated by the grand memory. At heart, and this I think is what I'll always remember, he made us want to be better people. That was really something. Perhaps Dr. Shriver's most beloved lectures dealt with Miami's favorite son, Williams Holmes McGuffey, which we know and recognize as the author of the McGuffey Readers, who became the schoolmaster of the nation, and his textbooks have sold over 130 million copies, second only to the Bible. And it is clear why he turned to McGuffey, because McGuffey taught the values so dear to Americans in crystal clear historical vignettes. They were based on the love of God and country, of family and work, of character and duty, honesty and frugality, kindness, consideration of others, moderation, sobriety. The readers taught the young generation to recognize the difference between right and wrong, to avoid temptation, and to know that righteous guilt was a good thing to help the suffering and the poor, the hungry, the depressed, and those in mourning, and they are so number, they're so highly numbered. These may have been McGuffey's values, but they were also the values of Phil Shriver, and they lay deep in his heart. But above all, it was Dr. Shriver's love of family which characterized him. Who could not be moved when he quoted Charles Dickens' tale of the little poem called The Death of Little Nell? That's what I said before. Get to the simplest things. They're the most profound. And it was a Christian message of hope recording the death at barely four years old of a precious gentle and noble little girl, and I quote, no sleep so beautiful and calm, so fair to look upon. She seemed a creature fresh from the hand of God. And when Nell died, she stretched out her arms to her heartbroken father and said, when I die, put me near something that love the light, and always had the sun and sky above it. You know, this is how we will remember Phil Shriver, a man whose selfless and timeless qualities touched us all. He will live on here wherever we look on this beautiful campus and in all kinds of weather, through the rain and the gorgeous snows that we have here. Dr. Shriver was not only a good man and a good teacher, he was a great man and a great teacher. He was a man who knew how to live, and he was a man who knew how to die.
Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I will bow in humble adoration and there proclaim. Philip Schreiber was well known for living an extraordinary public life. However, those closest to him are well aware at the center of his life was the love for his family and their love for him. Today, we are here to join that family in celebrating his life and sharing some of those cherished memories that they hold dear. Several have already mentioned Philip's adoring wife, Martha, and it's impossible to overstate the profound contributions of Martha Shriver and her husband's many, many successes. Martha, you are held in the hearts of one and all, and our thanks go to you for encouraging, for supporting, for loving, and for sharing Philip Shriver over the past 67 years. I'm also pleased to recognize with us here today Phil and Martha's five children, Carolyn Shaw, and here with her husband Bill, Susan Levine, Melinda Williams and her husband David, Darcy Shriver, and son Scott Shriver, who is here with his wife Vicki. Also, there are eight grandchildren, Trevor Helwig and his wife Tammy, or Tiffany, excuse me, get the right name, Ryan Helwig and his wife Jill, Lindsay Levine, Andrew Levine and his wife Melissa, Katie Lippman and her husband Wes, Ryan Williams, Cameron Shriver, and Kyle Shriver. Also present today are, four, are Phil's four great-granddaughters, Taylor, Avery, Marin, and Anna Helwig. In addition today, Phil's nieces and nephews, of whom he was also very proud in attendance, are Bob Close, here with his wife Donna, Dick Close, together with his wife Libby, and several grandnieces and nephews that he loved, loved dearly. Philip's older sister, Barbara Taylor, lives in Tampa, Florida, along with his dear nieces and nephew, could not be with us today, but a video recording of today's event will be sent to her. 
A big family, to be sure, but a very, very close family. We know he loved you more than words could possibly express. I'd like to now call to the podium Phil's son-in-law, David Williams, who will present remembrances from the family. Thank you. Uh, as you, you mentioned, my name is David Williams, and I'm uh, Phil and Martha's son-in-law. We had the good fortune of being married to their daughter Mindy for 37 years. The, uh, before I get started, one of the things that the family thought we would do today, if you notice, uh, Steve mentioned that all the nephews and nieces and uh, people that are here today from the family, but we all have red ties on red Miami ties, as a matter of fact. And the reason for that is that, that these are Phil's ties. We went through his closet and decided that we were all going to wear one of Phil's ties today. So everyone has one of Phil's ties on. Most of you uh, knew Phil Shriver uh, in his capacity, professional capacity, as a, in the community and as president of the university and as a teacher. And uh, we've heard those things and, and really appreciate them. And, but it's my privilege today to share with you a little bit about Phil Shriver, the son, the husband, father, uncle, father-in-law, grandfather, great-grandfather. For all of you who knew him best, his role in the family was the role he held closest and dearest to his heart. And it was what he felt most strongly about. The family was his greatest joy and, and, as he would say, his greatest privilege. The memories and insights I'm going to share with you today were prepared and assembled by Phil's children and his grandchildren. I get the privilege and honor of presenting those to you, and you may wonder why the son-in-law is here and not one of the children. And they asked me to explain, and I'll read. If you know the Shriver family well and have known them for any length of time, you know they are emotional. That is to say, they are criers. <laughs> they tear up at the drop of a hat. A sad movie, happy ending, newborn baby, even a funny joke could reduce them to mush. That is why none of the five Shriver children nor any of the grandchildren are here today speaking at this podium. Phil himself was emotional. He would get choked up now and again. Uh, but the family tells me they only saw him cry twice in public. One time was on the death of his beloved housekeeper at Lewis Place, Maxine Baudenstall, who we affectionately called Mrs. B. After decades of service, she was considered a member of the family. The second occasion when Phil cried in public was during the ceremony when he was retired, as, when he retired as president of Miami University. During that ceremony, there were many speeches about what he had done, and there were many kind and nice words about the lengths of his service to the university. Phil was very proud of that, very pleased, humbled by it. It was also announced at the at that ceremony that the university was naming the student center for him, the Shriver Center. That was a great honor, and he was also humbled and pleased about that, but not emotional. It was at the last part of the ceremony when it, when it was announced that he was being made an honorary member of the Alumni Association of Miami University. That brought tears to his eyes, because now he was officially a Miamian. Miami had accepted Phil Shriver as one of its own. Phil was born in Cleveland, August 16, 1922. His mother was Ruth and his father was Raymond. Ruth was one of the first registered nurses in the state of Ohio, and his father Raymond was a school teacher. He taught for 49 years from one-room schools in Ashland County to 36 years in the Cleveland Public Schools. Phil was very proud of the fact, as was mentioned earlier, that between he and his father, they taught for over a hundred years in the state of Ohio. Now, that was one of 
his crowning achievements. He brought that up many times. Dad told us uh, that during the Great Depression, his father continued to teach, though he went for eight months one year with no salary because the Cleveland schools were broke. Uh, sounds familiar. <laughs> he went to work every day because it was better to go to work than to do nothing. Eventually, his father settled with the city school system for pennies on the dollar. Phil spent his summers uh, when he was very young on his grandmother's farm in Kingsville, Ohio. There he raised chickens and rabbits, picked berries, and developed his first fascination for Indian arrowheads and spear points. He also developed a fascination by predetermining when each hen would lay its next egg. Throughout, throughout his middle school years, uh, Phil mowed the grass, cleaned hedges, and developed an egg root. He graduated from John Adams High School, where he was president and valedictorian of his class, vice president of the National Honor Society, and president of the student council. All the time, he kept peddling his eggs. He never considered his family poor. There was always enough to live on. His father repaired things, and his mother canned fruits and vegetables every summer. Both parents knew how to make every nickel count and how to make the most of the food that was available. They grew up knowing the meaning of hard work and the importance of making do. These are lessons that he passed on to his children. If you had the good fortune of knowing Phil on a personal level, and I did, and I was very fortunate to do so, you know that he had one true love in his life. That was his wife of 67 years, Martha. In fact, Phil and Martha celebrated their 67th wedding anniversary the week before Phil passed away. I can tell you that every night for 67 years, Phil kissed Martha, looked her square in the eye, and announced that she was his girl forever and ever. Phil and Martha met uh, on what might be termed a blind date. They were uh, she was at Wellesley and he was at Yale. And Phil's cousin, Jean Smith, who had known Martha from hometown in Bellevue, got the two of them together at the Harvard-Yale game. Problem was that Phil was a clarinet player in the marching band and he couldn't sit with Martha. So being the gentleman that he was, he had a stand-in who sat with her in the first half of the game. The uh, roommate played JV football and was kind enough to sit with Martha. And incidentally, the coach of the JV team was a Michigan player uh, who went on to other things. It was a fellow named Gerald Ford who later became president. <laughs> after uh, sitting through the first half of the game, Phil and Martha did meet each other after halftime and enjoyed dancing that evening. Before a month had passed, two things had occurred. Phil and Martha were sweethearts, and the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Phil spent the next three and a half years involved in naval operations and out in the Pacific. Phil and Martha were married April 15, 1944. And shortly and after he got out of the service, they moved to Kent where he began teaching at Kent State University. It's where they bought their first house and began their family. The second most important thing in his life behind Martha were his children. No matter how busy he was, no matter what he had going on, no matter what pressures he was under, the kids always said that he would stop, they could interrupt him any time, he would listen and discuss what was important to them. He was always home at dinner. And the discussion at dinner, and I can attest to this, the discussion at dinner was not about what he did for the day. 
It was about what each of them did for the day. What was important to each of them and what was going on in their lives. He always found time at the end of the day to tuck the kids in, each and every one of them. He rubbed their heads, told them stories until they fell asleep. He never encouraged them to take one career or another, they say. Instead, he said he didn't care what career path each of his kids took. As long, the only advice he'd given them was take a career where you can say, where you can't say. Don't get into something where you have to say, thank God, it's Friday. Find something in which you have a passion where you say, thank God, it's Monday. And that was Phil Shriver. He loved teaching more than anything. At his angriest, I never heard and the family never heard Phil utter a word of profanity. His lips would tense up, his jaw would clench, his eyes would get narrow, and he would exclaim, oh joy, <laughs> or great day in the morning. <laughs> Phil never smoked and he never drank. Uh, unless at a very special occasion it was a toast and there was a champagne, but then only a sip. He never even drank coffee or tea. When the family would go out for a special dinner on Sunday, Dad ordered chocolate milk or lemonade. His favorite food was ice cream. He liked to finish every meal with a dollop of ice cream, as he called it. In later years, he washed down some of the more undesirable pills he had to take with a small dish of ice cream. I think we all thought that it was just another excuse to have a dish of ice cream. There's a story that was passed around the family that when dad met with the trustees at Miami and, and they had asked him to be the president and he had accepted that they were going to go out for a celebratory drink. When asked what he would like, he said, I'd like a dish of ice cream. <laughs> Fittingly, dad's last meal was a dish of ice cream. When the family moved from Kent and their one bathroom house to Lewis Place in Oxford with its five and a half baths and its size, you can only imagine the culture shock for the kids. But mom and dad at that time kept the family grounded in the, what they called the goldfish bowl they lived in not allowing them to get the idea that life had changed in any way. It was amazing to the family how the phrase Uncle Phil, as he became to be called, fit dad to a T. As he truly believed, he saw his role as a surrogate relative to the thousands of students who passed through Miami. The family never felt like they'd lost their father by sharing him with the students at Miami. Rather, they felt they'd inherited thousands of cousins. One of the ways he earned the name Uncle Phil was borne out by a story that the family tells, and, and I'll repeat it here. So according to the story, one wintry night, the father of one of the Miami co-eds was very upset that his daughter was complaining about how cold her dorm room was. And he decided to do something about it, so he called the president at 11.30 at night and demanded that something be done. Phil assured him that he would do something. Imagine that young woman's shock when she came down to the dormitory lobby to find Phil Shriver standing there with blankets for her. Dad was a creature of habits, mostly good habits. He made a to-do list every single day. He made this list at the end of each day on a three by five index card, which he typed on his 1944 manual royal typewriter. We tried and tried and tried to get him to convert to electric typewriter or to computer, 
but to the very end, anything he typed was on that 1944 Royal typewriter. The day did not end for Dad until every item on that list was checked off and a new list was prepared for the next day. As was, has been mentioned, and as you all know, the family thinks it was destined that their dad became a historian. But that might not have been the case. Recently, he shared with all of us that in his first year at Yale, he planned to become a chemistry major. He enrolled in an introductory chemistry course, but was dismayed to find that the course was being taught by a graduate assistant who, although was very knowledgeable about the subject, just couldn't teach. At the same time, he enrolled in a course in the history department where the instructor was a full professor, very gifted at teaching. That professor made history come alive for dad, and from that time on, his focus was on history. That had an impact on him throughout his career as he strongly felt that the true strength of any college occurred in the classroom and that the best and most experienced teachers should not be limited to senior and graduate level courses, but should rather spend part of their time instructing freshmen. Because as he reasoned, the students who had already selected a major already knew the thrill of their subject, whereas freshmen required instruction in order to capture their imagination and ignite their curiosity. Dad also had the knack of remembering minutia, all kinds of minutia. <laughs> what might seem trivial to the rest of us was intriguing to him. He could tell you how much rainfall fell in the last 24 hours. He could tell you how much rain it fell last week, last month, and last year. And he could compare it to the year ago. He knew how many mice he had trapped in the basement <laughs> and in which traps. He knew how many fish he had, caught off the, had been caught off the dock at Lakeside and what species those fish were. And he, and he knew and could recite who owned all the family fishing records. And he loved, as, as you've heard, he loved music. And one of the other things he memorized was just about every song you can imagine on the Lawrence Welk show. And he would sing along, loudly. <laughs> on the family vacations, uh, when the children or when the kids were all younger, they would go on, on vacations and pile in the family car. And that consisted of singing camp songs or gospel songs by the hour. These road trips, I understand, usually featured driving through or to some important site in American history, at which point Phil, being the good historian that he was, would attempt to seize the teachable moment. However, I also understand that those in the back seat would simply complain they couldn't hear the rock and roll over the incessant talking. <laughs> Phil gave his daughters their very first dancing lessons. They would stand on his feet and they'd sway back and forth to the music. He taught his children to appreciate all types of music, from Broadway musicals to gospel, and from campfire songs to big band. Dad appreciated the beauty of nature and commented on their neighbor Marge Smith's gardens often. The last time he came home, he was with my wife, Mindy, and they stopped the car at the bottom of the hill on Bonham Road just so he could look at the garden. Holidays were always special in the Shriver household. We were talking about some of this earlier, particularly Christmas. Everyone came to Christmas. The troop that you saw came in today. All were at the Shriver house for Christmas, all the time. That was a very important holiday to Dad. And every Christmas morning began with Dad reading the most cherished letter from Santa, 
for, before handing out the first stocking full of gifts to the youngest and newest member of the family. Easter was next in line. After dinner at Easter, there was the annual water balloon baseball game. <laughs> Phil would dress in his long raincoat and put on one of Martha's rain bonnets and pitch water balloons to the kids who just enjoyed smashing them and spraying them with water. One of the other things that Phil enjoyed was Lakeside, Ohio, particularly sitting on the dock at Lakeside, Ohio and fishing with his children, with his grandchildren, and with his great-grandchildren, nieces and nephews. He was always there to bait the hooks and take the fish off the line. But I can tell you one of his minutiae moments, one of his favorite memories was the night when the white bass were running. And he told this story many times. The fish were making swells and jumping around and he caught 49 fish in 50 casts. And he never let us forget that. <laughs> when, he, when the 50th class reunion at Yale came around, each of the 50 uh, year classmates were asked to respond to some questions. And Phil responded to those questions and I want to share some of that with you. When he was asked what his favorite hobby was, he replied, and I quote, my principal hobby is my family. I have been blessed with a loving and caring wife, five wonderful children, eight beautiful grandchildren, and sons and daughters-in-law who share with us the love of family. I truly believe that Martha and I live in the best of all worlds, a small academic community that is truly a way of life for its residents. He was also asked to describe his most moving experience. And he responded this way, and again I quote, standing in the receiving line beside the coffin of Martha's father, when we received word that our eldest daughter had just been taken to the hospital with polio. After that experience, even the student anti-Vietnam War riots in the spring of 1970, which inflamed and tortured our campus, as well as hundreds of others, paled by comparison. And finally, he was asked to give his reflections on national and world conditions. And he replied this way, and I quote, Though I remain an internal optimist, I am heartsick over the continuing erosion of moral and ethical standards throughout the United States and the world. Not the least of the casualties of this erosion has been the nuclear family, heretofore the very heart of human society over the millennia. In our zeal to advance individual rights, we have failed to assure the collective rights of society. Freedom was born a twin, and the twin's name is responsibility. Freedom without responsibility leads to ultimate anarchy and total chaos. Freedom with responsibility is what we all thought we were fighting for in the war that claimed so many of our classmates a half century ago. I understand that there's a uh, oft-quoted uh, reference quote that's somewhere on a sculpture near the hub here on campus and I haven't seen it but I think it says to think that in such a place I led such a life. For thousands of Miamians this is a statement of the best sums up their undergraduate experience here at Miami but for the Shriver family it sums up their 46 years in, Oxford, in the Oxford and Miami communities that have been an absolute joy for the Shriver family. To those of you who are here today and that have been part of Dad's rich and wonderful life, we thank you for helping us remember and celebrate this very remarkable man. One of Dad's special requests for his memorial service was that was to have two of his youngest grandsons 
play one of his favorite songs, a piece played nine years ago at his 80th birthday, Time to Say Goodbye. Cameron and, Cameron and Kyle Shriver, his grandchildren, have recorded this piece to provide a com accompaniment for our final photo tribute this afternoon.
As you've heard, Philip Schreiber was a singer, loved music. He sang early on as a soloist in his church and as the bass voice with the traveling Schreiber station wagon singers. <laughs> it was a homegrown seven-piece outfit, if you hadn't heard of them. Uh, they might have given the Von Trapp family a little run for its money if somebody would have learned to play something other flute or piano. I don't know. He sang softly when alone in his office at the rear of Lewis Place when all else had gone, everyone else had gone to bed. He sang loudly at every Miami athletic event when the band would play the fight song or Old Miami. He loved to sing, and he sang as a proud member of the Yale Glee Club in his undergraduate days. Martha and Phil rarely missed an opportunity to attend the Miami Glee Club concert and loved to show their support of the Glee Club whenever they could. Now, the feeling was mutual, as was evidenced one hot evening in August nine years ago when the brothers in song showed up at Martha and Phil's yard to sing happy birthday. Luckily, there was enough cake for the event. Today, the Glee Club sends their love and very heartfelt condolences to Martha from, ironically, Luxembourg, where the Glee Club is. They're in the midst of a European tour. But no celebration of Phil Schreiber's life would be complete without their participation. So, in a command performance for the Schreiber family, I am pleased to introduce the Miami University Glee Club alumni, nearly 40 strong, who have traveled to Oxford from far and wide to provide this musical tribute. Gentlemen.
And now let us go in peace. And may God bless you and keep you. May God be kind to you and gracious. May God look upon you with favor and grant you peace, both now and forever. Amen. The Schreiber family is grateful for your attendance today and invites you to gather on the concourse for some time with each other, perhaps sharing your own recollections along with some light refreshment provided by the Schreiber Center. They also hope that if you hadn't had a chance to sign one of the guest books, please take the opportunity to do so. There are four of them in the main lobby. Thanks again to each and every one of you, Philip Schreiber's family, friends, colleagues, for joining us today here to celebrate a good life. Good afternoon, everyone.